Computing in the Future, Neurons, Real and Artificial. I'm Van Warren. Part one, we're going to talk about some real neurons. In part two, we'll talk about artificial neurons. And after that, we'll wrap up with a question and answer period. I want to start with real neurons. And when I say real, I'm being a little pejorative because we're going to have a stand-in for our real neurons, which is a skull and a simulated brain gelatin and uh, some pH equivalent chemicals and some saline and also some magnetic sensors, which are really tiny compasses, which work quite well for this purpose. Here we see the VTMS, which I've named the unit. I put Vs before things I create. And we have a stimulator for the left half and the right half of the brain. And of course, our stand in here, we call him Larry. So I'm gonna show you a little video of how this worked. Okay, this is the uh, prototype running. The two TMS units are spinning under control of their respective power supplies. And uh, they each contain an array of six times three magnets, 18 magnets each in a hexagon. And then the uh, simulated brain is uh, here. If I can light it better. I have to manually place the TMS units in proximity to the brain in order to cause the uh, magnetic sensors to activate. And you can hear them all start chattering as that happens. Let's see if I can make that on video. So here we'll bring one in. And that causes an audible high frequency choking. And you can see they're variably activated depending on their distance from the magnet. So that's that. And each one of the units can be independently controlled. Is where the project is right now. So, so here are some slides where I talk about the different components. Here are the bilateral power supplies. I call them bilateral because there's one for each TMS unit. And each TMS unit is provided with voltage for the rotors and the backlights, as well as uh, safe current and power levels. There's individual RPM adjustment in both fine and coarse as we vary the voltage from the nominal 12 to 24 volts. During that time, it'll draw zero to 200 milliamps. And if you run that, that is about a half a watt of uh, motive power that's going into turning the magnetic fields that are produced by this array of permanent magnets. The banana plugs are reversible so that the directions of the TMS units can be reversed with respect to each other. And the rotational rates are intended to encompass all the common brain frequencies. So here's the magnetic pulse generator holder that's just basically a plastic disc that is uh, magnetically transparent and holds the uh, one inch neodymium magnets these are then 3d printed such that the there was a press fit for the magnets i was really pleased with how these turned out and how accurate the tolerances were the silver thing on the left is the hub adapter that adapts the rotors to the motor and here's the DC permanent magnet motor that drives the unit that's rated nominally for 600 RPM, but can be varied from zero to about 800 RPM by varying the voltage. These are very robust motors. And these magnets, these grade N52 neodymium magnets, are the most powerful magnets available. Each little disc, which is about the size of a quarter, generates nearly a 10 pound pull force at around one Tesla of magnetic field strength. When these magnets are placed into the rotors, I place them such that their poles alternate. So they'll be north, south, north, south, north, south. And this gives the maximum possible change in magnetic field as the rotors turn. Each of the six magnets can be stacked three deep for a total of 18 magnets that generate a pull force of 171 pounds. The thinking is, is that if 
permanent magnet stimulation is viable, we're going to have to create a pretty strong magnetic field. Here's a computer-aided design sketch of the same unit. And if we align it correctly, you can see the rotor, the backlight holder, the motor, and the mounting bracket. Here you can see this funny little part with arms that enables the uh, backplate light to sit right behind the rotor. And this is just an additional shot. Here's the real 3D printed part. It's held in position by these three millimeter uh, Allen wrench screws. And then here's the same thing with the uh, LED backlight plate in place. And here is the assembly placed into the enclosure that you saw before. And here was the original wiring diagram. This evolved quite a bit over time. And uh, even the controller system evolved over time and was simplified. There's been a long history of brain interfaces which started with the Aztecs trepanning each other. Then in the early 30s in this country there was something called an ice pick lobotomy where right above the eye socket an ice pick was inserted so as to uh, stir the contents of the prefrontal cortex and they noticed patients were less depressed afterwards. Then came electroconvulsive therapy and then came uh, magnetic resonance imaging, which is a non-invasive way of imaging the state of the brain. That was followed by PET scan, which used a glucose as a marker. And that was followed by functional MRI, which was able to see how changes in the brain occurred over very short time frames. And about the time of functional MRI, transcranial magnetic stimulation came on the scene with high voltage figure eight coils that generated a very large a magnetic field pulse, basically an EMP, and that EMP was powerful enough to transit the skull, the meninges, and into the cortex proper, which is the surface of the brain. I wanna talk a little bit now about artificial neurons or machine learning neural networks. And I wanna talk about basis functions. And another way of saying that is uh, don't ask a cat AI about dogs, meaning that if we train an AI or a machine learning program to understand cats and we ask it then about a dog, it's not going to know what a dog is because a dog is not in its basis set. So I want to quickly go over an example of that. TensorFlow Playground is the framework I used to investigate this. It, it was written by Daniel Smilkoff and Shan Carter at Google. TensorFlow is actually a large body of Python code. It's an end-to-end -end open source machine learning platform. It's a fantastic open source product and it's helped in the AI winter because it's been open sourced and everybody can use it and a lot of people are contributing to it. TensorFlow is written in Python, a compact white space limited language that's very easy to learn and use. TensorFlow Playground is written in TypeScript, which is an open source superset that's maintained by Microsoft. And TensorFlow Playground is really a distinct product that's separate from TensorFlow itself. But it's housed under the same roof because the same group at Google helped develop it. Now, one thing to know is that neural networks are about pattern recognition. And pattern recognition traditionally has been easy for people and hard for computers. Speech synthesis was accomplished a long time before speech recognition, and that's generally been true. And also music synthesis was achieved way before music recognition. So it's easy for computers to generate patterns, but it's much harder for them to recognize them. And that's what neural networks do very well. So in traditional programming, we say, given an input and in our algorithm, we find the output by putting the input into the algorithm and crunching it and finding what we got. In machine learning, we have really the opposite. Given an input and an output, we want to find the algorithm that produces the output from the input. And so those inputs are called features. So here we have a simple function in programming language that would compute Fahrenheit degrees given Celsius degrees in the conversion formula. And here we see the input, the output, and the algorithm. In machine learning, we can do the same thing. We can define a function we can train that function that when it sees a certain Celsius temperature, that it should produce the corresponding Fahrenheit temperature as output. And if we train the algorithm sufficiently effectively, then it'll produce the conversion that we want. Now, machine learning can be divided into a couple bins. 
The first bin is supervised versus unsupervised learning. In supervised learning, we label the images, then we present an unknown image and ask the neural network, what was the image? And so if all the neural network has seen our cats, it's not going to ever be able to tell us what a dog is. In supervised versus unsupervised learning, learning images are not labeled. They are clustered using a learning algorithm, such as k-means, multiple means clustering, association, or even genetic algorithms. This is much harder, but it's also potentially more interesting. So in our taxonomy of machine learning types, we have supervised versus unsupervised. Under supervised, we have two categories that are commonly seen. One is classification that we're going to be doing here, and the other is regression. In unsupervised learning, as I mentioned, there's clustering and association, and these, there's quite a bit more detail in these trees. Here are the basis functions we might use for drawing a person. We could use lines to draw the person. We could use triangles. We could use circles of one color but different sizes. Or we could use colored circles. As we enrich our basis function set, we're more likely to not only be able to draw a person more accurately, but most importantly in machine learning, we're going to be able to recognize a person more comprehensively. So as I've said all along, if the feature isn't in the basis set, the AI will never recognize it. So let's do an example with the TensorFlow Playground. Before we run the Playground, let's learn what the controls are quickly. You have a stop, start, reset button, like you would see on a VCR, and it controls the session. You have the epoch counter, which tells you how many epochs or learning steps you are into the solution. It's a close approximation to execution time and the cost of running the neural network. The learning rate is how fast we allow the system to learn with each step. Slow learning rates increase the cost of training it. Fast learning rates can often fail to converge. Learning rate is one of a set of hyperparameters that tune the model and allow it to function at its best. And optimizing the hyperparameters is an open area of research. The next thing we have is the activation function selector. There's various types of activation functions, which basically say, if I'm a neuron receiving inputs, here's how I'm going to respond and produce an output. Activation functions are also a hyperparameter. Although they're an active area of research as well, there's less variation in activation functions. But there is some difference in performance that's obtained by changing them. Now, in the TensorFlow Playground, there's a data set selector, which gives us four options for point patterns that we want to train the system to recognize. In these quadrants, we have these two kinds of data points we want to classify, the orange dots and the blue dots that are in this pattern. There are four different patterns we want to train the neural network to recognize. In the upper left quadrant, we have this orange and blue dotted circular pattern. In the upper right, we have a square pattern. In the lower, we have a two clusters of points. And in the lower right, as a pattern that's very difficult to recognize, which is this spiral pattern of blue and orange dots. Now keep in mind, these are just four patterns that we're training to recognize, but you could have any image here, an image of four cats, an image of four dogs, or an image of two cats and two dogs, in which case you'd be able to represent cats and dogs, but neither very well. The next control we see on the left is this ratio of training data to test data. And in these examples, we're gonna be using an even test train split. Half of our data will be used to train the model and half of the data will be used to validate the model. And this is also a hyperparameter. By varying the ratio of training to test data, you can get different outcomes. The noise percentage is interesting. In traditional deterministic programming, we don't use noise. We don't like noise and the whole digital assumption was that we have eliminated noise. But in neural networks, noise can help the Net neural network trained faster and avoided a phenomena called overfitting, where you actually train the model just to recognize what it's seen, but not to be able to recognize things that are like what it's seen. This hyperparameter can be varied as well. And you usually want on the order of 10 or so percent of noise in your training session so that when you present the system with new data, that will fit within that bound. The feature selector is the main thing that I've modified. These are the basis functions that come with TensorFlow Playground, and they're also the input to the neural network. And it's what we're going to extend in the demonstration to show, hopefully, some improvement in how the system works. The final center window is the neural network architecture. These interior layer layers are called hidden layers in a deep layer neural network. 
and the thickness of the lines between them shows the weight that that neuron contributes to the final pattern recognition process that takes place. The output learning curves we see on the right, and they're just these two, these two curves, which in this example are two straight lines, show us our test loss and our training loss. And ideally, they converge to the same value when the neural network is trained, and we'll see these jump around. When we get down to about uh, on the order of 1% variation or so, the neural net becomes usable for pattern recognition. But if it's higher than that, we might see it as being unreliable. Output classification is done when the colored zones match color dot distribution that the neural net is trained and classifying. So this is easier seen than explained, so we'll see how this works in a moment. So we did uh, eight runs to begin with, and then we're going to extend the system and do four runs, and we're going to compare how well we did. So here's the first run. For 128 epochs with four input neurons and two output neurons, we have no internal layers, but we have neurons that process the features and neurons that take the input neurons and process their data to give us an output. Long story short, this system converges very fast to a 1% training loss. When the system trains this rapidly, we might let it continue to run and to train, but we get most of the value of the training very early on in the training process. So we don't have to keep training this model forever for it to do a good job. So for this next case, um, it also converges very rapidly to a high quality result. And then in this two point clustered sets, we see it, it has very uh, good uh, statistics. You can see that the neural net hasn't t t drawn a straight line. It says the distribution of these points is such that this, these two clouds are how we would classify them. Finally, on the spiral with 128 epochs, we aren't anywhere near recognizing this pattern. So we might want to increase the sophistication of our neural net in the hope that we could recognize this difficult spiral pattern. And by recognize, I mean classify that spiral pattern. So now we're going to run through the same things, but we're going to have six hidden layers. So our four input neurons connect to six, then to eight, then to eight, then to six, then to four. And if you look carefully at each of the pictures of the neuron tiles, they tell you what each neuron is, is recognizing in the image and how those combined patterns are being formed into made a level understanding of what the image is. And even so, each neuron in the whole deep layer network has a, has a responsibility that it takes on during the learning process that's completely novel with each run. And here we see that with these six hidden layers, we converge pretty well, but you can see that in our output curves on the, in the upper right that we have some uh, wavering in the loss in the system, which tells you that the system comes initially to fast convergence, but then it kind of wanders around as it tries to figure out what's going on. Well, the reason is, is that we're now training many more neurons than we were. We were just training six neurons before. And now we're tr training 10, 20, 36 neurons. And here's the next pattern that also uh, converges pretty rapidly, but has a little bit of noise in it. And there's the third pattern. The fourth pattern, we're seeing that with this deep layer neural network, it's doing a better job. It's not doing a perfect job, but it's doing a little better than it was before. But it's still not good enough that we would release this code and use it to recognize spiral patterns. So my small contribution in this was to experiment in adding two new basis functions or features into the neural net. And I'll show you at the end the process that I used to do that. But for now, we do a new run, four data sets, same amount of noise, same number of epochs, and we run the data sets in that same clockwise order of each pattern. But we're going to just run it with new basis functions. So we're going to add two new basis functions and see if we can do a little bit better. Unlike before, when we had a highly connected uh, deep neural network that had 36 neurons, here we're just going to have 12 neurons because that'll cost less. And we're going to see with the new basis functions, which you can see in the features column at the end, F and G of X1 and X2, the two spatial parameters, we're going to see if with better basis functions, if we can't do a better job recognizing these, 
without having to have the full expense of multi-layered neural network. So here we see this, the second uh, pattern. It does converge very quickly. It's usable. The third pattern, it's very much usable. And the fourth pattern is better than we ever did before with the deep layer neural network because the two basis functions are helping the system to recognize spirals better. Again, we just used 128 epochs. If we were to allow this to run a little longer, it would converge to a useful value and we could release the code. So the quality of the basis functions, in short, determine how much bang we get for our CPU, GPU, or TPU training dollar. Machine learning runs are not repeatable since the training and test data are permuted differently each time. But using a random seed, we can fix this. So I'm going to show you really quickly how this was done. I went to TensorFlow. I looked for the source on GitHub, and they were very generous at Google Brain to open source not only TensorFlow, but the code to this playground. I then found the GitHub version, and I uh, downloaded that version, and I unpacked it on my machine, and then I modified these five files to add the basis functions, and that was all that was necessary to accomplish this. So that's the end of my talk, first with real neurons and then with artificial neurons, and my intention was to try to bring these two ideas together in some novel way. But I thought it might be interesting to ask your opinion on how you might see the two ideas brought together in a novel way. And here's two starter questions. How would you combine real and artificial neural networks? And how would you combine TMS, this transcranial magnetic stimulation, and artificial neural nets? And that's it.